Joshua Jeffries. Joshua Jeffries was a 11-year-old boy who attended Lewis Elementary School where he had just completed 6th grade. Joshua and his sister Liana lived with his mother's friend Gail Hoford after his birth mother went to jail when he was young. He lived in Gail's home along with her roommate Diane Lovett and Gail's daughter Shannon. On August 10, 2001, Joshua went to a friend's house down the street for a slip and slide. He returned home at around 5.45 p.m. for dinner and went back out to another friend's house to play. He came back home at 8.30 p.m., changed his clothes, watched some TV and had a snack. At 10 p.m., Joshua went to bed in a room at the back of the house that originally served as a laundry room and back entryway. Shortly after, Gail and her roommate went to bed in the room at the front of the house. Liana's room was closest to Joshua's and she went to bed around midnight. A screen door was shut but unlocked and the outside door of the house was left open for Gail's daughter who was sleeping in a camper at the far end of the backyard and also to allow the dogs to go in and out. At around 4.23 am, Joshua opened Gail's room and said, Auntie Gail, someone came into my room. He then collapsed on the floor. At first, Gail thought he was walking in his sleep, but when she turned on the light, she saw Gail in a pool of blood. She immediately called 911. An ambulance rushed Joshua to Oregon Health and Science University Hospital, where he was pronounced dead at 5 a.m. At first, Gail thought Joshua had been stabbed, but an autopsy revealed he had died of a single gunshot wound with the bullet entering through his upper back and exiting just under his left arm. Everyone at the house said they did not hear any gunshot. However, their neighbor Alex Ross said he had heard a muffled sound of a gunshot when he was working on his computer around 4 am. He looked and shortly after he saw lights and heard screaming coming from the house. What's puzzling to the investigators is that no one had heard the dogs barking. Usually, anyone walking on the property is greeted by a Rottweiler who growls and barks ceaselessly at strangers as she jumps against the 4 foot high chain link fence. The other dog, a Dachshund, also barks seeing a stranger, but none of the family members or the neighbors heard them barking that night. Based upon blood evidence at the scene, it was apparent that Joshua was in his bed and very likely sleeping when he was shot. Police have been unable to find any motive for this heinous crime. No one had any disagreements with Joshua and he had no gang or drug ties. There have been no leads and no suspects. The case remains unsolved for 19 years. Elenia Carisi Elenia Maria Sol Carisi, born on November 29, 1970, was the eldest daughter of the Italian singers and actors Albano Carisi and Romina Power. Her maternal grandparents were American actor Tyrone Power and Mexican actress Linda Christian. In 1983, she appeared with her parents in the film Champagne in Paradiso. Later on, she was a letter turner on the Italian version of Wheel of Fortune. She had planned to become a novelist and studied literature at King's College London. During her studies in London, she decided to take a break from studies and travel the world on her own with nothing but a backpack and her journal. She would return to Italy and sold all her belongings in order to fund her trip. She told her parents that she wanted to write a book about street artists and homeless people. She then went to Belize where she spent a few months in Hopkins, a small coastal village with a community of 1000 people. Her brother Yari, who was an experienced traveler, decided to surprise her sister on the Christmas day. Yari arrived in Hopkins on 27 December 1993 and started to search for her going door to door only to find out that she had left the day before and boarded a bus heading for Mexico. Yari returned to Italy, not realizing he would never see her again. Elenia's parents last heard from her on New Year's Day of 1994 when she had called her family from the Liddell Hotel in New Orleans where she had been staying. Elenia and her parents had been to New Orleans on a vacation about six months before. 
There she had met a street musician Alexander Masekela, a 55-year-old cornet player with a Jamaican accent, when he gifted her the book New Think by Edward D. Bono. Enchanted by the city and apparently by Alexander, Elenia decided to stay behind when her parents went on to Florida. Two days later, Elenia had rushed to Florida telling her parents that she feared that two men were trying to drug and kill her. So when this time she mentioned that she was staying in New Orleans with Alexander Masekela, Elenia's father got very upset and had a fight with her. In New Orleans, Elenia mingled with the street musicians and the homeless and took notes. Elenia was last seen on 6 January 1994 by the owner of the Ledell Hotel when she was leaving the hotel. She was not reported missing until 14th January when Alexander approached the reception and showed Elenia's passport to the hotel staff and attempted to use her traveler's check to pay the bill for their room. But the checks were refused because they were unsigned. The staff alerted the police and Elenia's parents were notified who immediately left for New Orleans. When questioned, Alexander told the police he did not know Elenia's whereabouts but believed that she was alright. Alexander said they slept in separate beds during the time they shared the hotel room and she refused to have a sexual relationship with him in spite of his urgings. He had a history of drug use and sexual violence as well as a reputation as a guru. Alexander was arrested on 31st January after his former girlfriend claimed he had raped her but he was soon released due to lack of evidence. No evidence regarding Elenia's whereabouts was discovered in the hotel. Most of her personal belongings including her passport, backpack, clothing, camera, luggage and notebooks were left behind at the hotel. Soon, a security guard would come forward and said that on the day Elenia disappeared on 6th January, he had seen a girl matching Elenia's description jump into the Mississippi River near Aquarium of the Americas at 11.30 pm. The woman had been acting strangely before she jumped into the water. The guard had yelled at her to stay away from the water and she said, I belong in the water. She swam for approximately 100 yards then began to struggle against the current and the wave from the passing boat. She screamed for help and then sank. The Coast Guard searched 90 miles of the river almost to the Gulf of Mexico and found only a body of an unidentified man. It has never been established that the person was in fact Yelenia. In 1996, two years after her disappearance, an unidentified caller claimed that Yelenia was still alive but her whereabouts were unknown. Since January 1994, there have been many reported sightings of her in United States and Europe even more than decades after her disappearance. However, none of the sightings have been confirmed and her case remains unsolved. Henrik Suyak Henrik Suyak was a 46-year-old Polish man who worked for the Polish State Railways as an inspector. He had two children, Gabriela and Adam, and lived with his wife, Eva, who was a high school biology teacher. In 2000, he was laid off from his job and Poland's failing economy and 15% unemployment rate was making it difficult for him to find another. He decided to visit her sister Lucina, who had been living in New York for six years. Henrik very much enjoyed New York and despite having no work permit, he decided to stay and do whatever work he could to support his family back in Poland. Henrik did not know English and struggled to learn even after taking classes and watching television, although he was still able to find work. Throughout 2001, he worked at a construction site in Lower Manhattan. But on the morning of September 11, 2001, Henrik arrived to work at the construction site when he witnessed two planes smash into the World Trade Center towers. After the terrorist attacks, the site was closed down as Manhattan was evacuated. After hearing this, Henrik decided to look for other jobs until his work was able to resume. He traveled back to his sister's house where he called his wife to let her know he was safe. His wife told him to stay home for the day, but he insisted in wanting to earn extra cash for the family. He walked to a Polish employment agency in Brooklyn 
where he was able to secure a position cleaning a pathmark supermarket that night for about $10 an hour. He did not know the area, so he and his landlady looked over a subway map to figure out the route he was going to take. The store was located on the 1500 block of Albany Avenue in Brooklyn, but they both unknowingly looked up the wrong address. Henrik is believed to have gotten off the train near 1 Albany Avenue in Bedford Stuyvesant, arriving at the start of the avenue, nearly 4 miles from where Henrik was supposed to go. He then turned right, again going the wrong way in the wrong neighborhood. The area was known to be dangerous. What happened next is unclear, but around 11.40 pm, Henrik was shot multiple times. A woman living on the nearby Decatur Street, who was taking care of her sick mother, said she heard the gunshots but was too afraid to look out the window. Henrik was able to cross the Decatur Street and rang a doorbell in search for help. The resident of the building told the police that she had heard it, but like her neighbor, she was too fearful to answer the door in the wake of the gunfire that had preceded it. Henrik collapsed on the street. At 11.42 pm, the police were notified. When authorities arrived, he was pronounced dead at the scene. Due to the terrorist attacks occurred earlier in the day, the resources available for the investigation was limited. An evidence collection team, which normally responds to burglaries and other non-fatal crimes, scoured the scene and investigators searched for witnesses. The evidence collection team were able to retrieve spent shell casings from the 40 caliber handgun that was fired at Henrik. The shooter had fired seven times but hit him only once. A woman would come forward and said she had seen Henrik on Albany Avenue before he was killed. She claimed Henrik was followed by three or four African-American males. However, they couldn't be identified and it is unclear if they had any connection with his murder. Authorities were certain that robbery was not a motive, as he still had $75 in his pocket when he died. One theory suggests that Henry came across someone who could have mistakenly thought he had something to do with the attacks earlier. At the time of his murder, he was wearing camouflage pattern clothing and a pair of black army boots. He had a dark complexion and spoke poor English with heavy accent. But this theory hasn't been proven or ruled out. With no leads and no suspects, his case remains unsolved.